recently dealt out. Fantastic everyone's here um, for this subject. Raw milk. When I started tasting it, I was almost shocked by how much flavour it had and started being really interested in milk. And it's an increasingly important subject and also uh, controversial. And so it's great that as a guild we can get stuck in and taste and particularly talk to the farmers, and we've got a statement from a microbiologist to look at that a bit, so we can have questions. Um, uh, as you know, it's, well, Nick's going to set the scene as to the legality and what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Um, and we're particularly pleased that we've got farmers here, so as Gil wants to say thank you very much for coming along. Um, so, and thank you very much, Nick, for hosting us. Um, does everyone know, here know Nick? James Beard shortlisted. <laughs> I went and I came back without the trophy. Oh, oh, shortlisted. Oh, memorable. <laughs> I was so stoic. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> and we, well, Nick will tell who else is here, what a journalist he's written about, a feature of the Guardian about raw milk, which will be really interesting as well. Okay, so thanks. Thanks, Happy. Welcome everybody to the Food House Cafe. So um, this is our humble uh, cafe that was designed to feed me because I'm so difficult. And, uh, <laughs> our office behind here, um, we decided that um, to humble and to, to, to uh, humour me rather than we should have a cafe. But seriously, we began this cafe two years ago on the same principles that uh, we all believe in, which is access to really great tasting, honest, decent food. And uh, my office is behind there. I established Free Health 14 years ago with Camilla, some of you may know, my wife. And we drove from strength to strength based on the principles of encouraging everybody to be in good health. And a lot of your being in good health is about the quality of the nourishment. And um, what we're doing here this evening is we're not going to be thinking about a beverage, we're actually thinking about food. No piece of food, I think you'll agree, it's actually food. There is a raw milk diet, which we will come across that, but there is. Um, and you can live on raw milk, more or less. Now, raw milk has been a fascination for me for many years, and our children, who are now 13 and 14, have drunk nothing else after weaning other than raw milk. And um, what I consider is, is the right of all of us to be able to make a choice as to the quality of the milk that we have access to. And as um, Patty said, John Henry is here, an old university friend of mine, who I introduced Dave and Rosie to. He wrote a feature piece about raw milk three or four years ago. And it was largely the full of the sort of crescendo of social media bullying. But he received more interesting comments about the piece <laughs> more than any other piece. He's just seen other written polite. Right? Okay. So that's quite something. So John isn't here to write about this mad cat group of enthusiasts. He's actually here just because I asked him to come. And I think he'll be able to provide you all this insights. So the running order this evening, and we haven't got much time in the sense that we've got lots to do, is that we're going to, I'm going to set the scene, and then um, we're going to be um, uh, really thinking about the essential qualities of milk through men's history. And then without much further to do, we're going to go straight into tasting some everyday milks. And they're going to be the everyday milks you can buy from a supermarket or a store, or, and they're not raw. And we'll do that. And then what I'll do is once we've done that, and you've hopefully bought in notebooks, there's some paper at the back and pens if you want to make notes. This is going to be blind tasting. It's going to be our duty in a sense I'll introduce what they are, and give you some of the background in terms of the fat content, the provenance of the milk, and so on. And then as fast as we can, we'll get to the real quality of the evening, which is raw milk. And we'll do that through the eyes of the farmers, that's Dave and Rosie from Herbert and Somerset. Here and then Tali, cheesemaker, and Gala, who's also a, um, a, a, a herdswoman or a, a shepherd, and as, as you'll find out from that farm, Poor Hatch near Forest uh, Road in Sussex, um, more or less quite a few of the farm workers help with the milking. And in fact, there's a wonderful image 
of just what um, Bilkin's all about from my book. So this is a claw hatch, and this is in fact, you can show the classic back-breaking work of a typical step-up egg parlor, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. <laughs> um, and this is, this is a small herd, um, and this is the claw hatch milk that it takes. We've then got other guest milks here that are also um, raw, and we're going to be tasting different breed varieties. And again, I'll talk about that. Now, Tali is very shy and wants me to talk about the milk. And she's actually going to talk about cheese making, because Tali is an award winning cheese maker, raw milk cheese maker. So we're really lucky to say that some amazing farmers here. Um, we're personal friends and we like supporting anywhere I can. Um, and then we'll taste other milks, Jersey milk and Belliard milk. And uh, we've also got a, so that's it, not Belliard, Jersey. I think that's it. So we've got plenty to do. And then afterwards, there's going to be Q&A to me, to the farmers, you can direct your questions to John. And we'll also, we're privileged to have raw butter made, uh, artisan raw butter made by Rosie and Tali, who don't make, milk, don't make butter all the time. In fact, they don't make butter at all, but I asked them to make it <laughs> on the basis that um, if I asked, they couldn't say no. So we will taste that, so there's lots to do. So We've also got Fernie Farm butter, which you can buy, no. and a couple of pasteurised um, butters, which are farm butters, yeah. those are the interests, and creams as well. Yeah. But we're going to do that, people can go and help themselves. Indeed, and then there's the food, and we've got some natural wines that I've sourced for you, so without sulfides, mm -hmm. uh, the only wine I'll drink, and if you want to know more about that, then obviously you'll find out uh, more about that raw wine. Measure on and they'll go all about natural wines. So that's the sort of energy of the evening. Everybody happy with that? We'll, we'll get going. Now, um, milk is, um, okay, so there is, is uh, milk from cows, from asses, from uh, goats in Italy. Goats, uh, uh, donkey milk is used by uh, mothers when they can't get enough of their own milk because donkey milk is one of the closest milks to, to our human milk. So milk has been the um, has been an essential food through man's history, but it wasn't always that way. And in fact, if you draw a line, uh, larger east of Hungary, you won't find milk being drunk at all. And in fact, you'll find a lot of people to the east of Hungary are actually unable to digest milk. Uh, I think you'll probably, uh, as anybody from an Asian background will know, they don't, Asians predominantly don't have enzyme lactase to be able to digest milk. And it will actually create an in, more or less instant digestive complaint if they drink milk. Okay. Other cultures in India, for instance, have used milk, uh, buffalo milk, uh, as a way to uh, bring energy into their communities by making ghee, for instance, using the cream to make ghee. But they won't generally drink the milk. They'll actually, because of uh, reasons of wanting to preserve it, they'll actually make a fermented food, such as dye or yogurt, or they'll make a lassi or a drink using yogurt, and then. Throughout man's history, we have largely not drunk milk. When the first of the Mesopotamians brought their herds up into Europe, they collided with the locals, and there was a genetic recombination that took place that created an, an ability to tolerate lactose, or to be able to digest lactose by creating the enzyme lactase. You're really with me so far. Mm -hmm. So these, these are aurochs and all the animals, and the donkeys, and the camels, and asses. They were used to make fermented drinks, and nobody really drank raw milk. And as I say, to this day, people really to the east of that border of Hungary don't drink milk. They'll drink fermented milk, kvass, uh, and, and so on. That happy moment was the beginnings of the advantage for humans to have the lactase enzyme. And that then persisted in Western European genetic traits because it gave an advantage for the mothers to be able to give a child milk. And that was an easy access to energy. You all know that lactose is, I mean, you, you take a baby and you go from being a baby on the breast to being a toddler. That's phenomenal. And it's all about the lactose, it's largely about the lactose. Lactose is rocket fuel. And if you're a cancer sufferer, one of the first things they take you off is dead. And the reason for that is Lactose. It is a real, real high energy source. 
So then what happened was that we found ourselves uh, habituated to drinking milk, and it gave us an advantage. So therefore, we began the pastoral scene, if you can imagine, that colic scene of everybody having this sort of romantic scene. Everybody had a milk cow, and there were small herds throughout Western Europe, and milk was the staple of village and farm life. At the same time, most cows that were the original breeds, you have to keep with me here, were of a certain lipoprotein type, type called A2. And A2 is a fully digest, more fully digestible protein than um, what we mostly find ourselves supplied with today. Because there was a, as they went into mass production of milk, so the A1 protein became prevalent in the, in the mass production through the selective breeding. And people, therefore, are now faced with not only all of the complexity around pasteurized and homogenized milk, but also the choice between A1 and A2. Who's seen the campaigns about A2 milk? Does it make sense to you? Big in New Zealand, it's all about A2 milk. And they're trying to premiumize milk. Like, I went out shopping today, and I, I'm sorry, I couldn't buy the filtered milk because it had a shelf life of three weeks. I just wouldn't bring you to here if you could taste it. I didn't want to poison you. And I wasn't going to bring you the A2 milk because I just think it's a load of old tosh. Because, um, in fact, if you buy milk from farms where they have original um, uh, breeds, such as Guernsey, Jersey, uh, Mercer, and this sort, there is a higher preponderance of A2 genetics in there, and farmers can breed A2 genetics. So, everybody with me on that, on that basis, A2 milk was the benchmark of our existence, you know, of our building our Western European community, and then that extended over into America. Fast forward now to, and that point was very much a uh, uh, um, uh, raw milk was standard. Just like in years past, nobody thought about clean or dirty food, or they thought about organic or conventional food. It was actually people were more worried about whether they found any food at all. So now we've become a something obsessed with the sort of whether our food is good for you or whether it's bad for you. It's nonsense. Um, so milk was exactly the same. We come to the Industrial Revolution and urbanization. Britain was the pioneer of this um, movement towards the, towards the towns and the cities. And all of a sudden, you found yourself divorced from the relationship with a cow and at ready access to food. But mothers still knew that the milk was what they would give their children to supplement their, um, their nourishment. And where I live in Wandsworth, there was a dairy behind the house we're in. And I'm sure all of you living in London or, or in the suburbs will know that there were dairies. And there are apocryphal stories of dairies in New York City where they fed all the, the cows and brewers grains and they were shopping on their feet because they were desperate to try to bring the milk to the consumer without the benefit of refrigeration and mass, and mass transportation. This is where the trouble began. It also began, as Rosie will tell you, with the fact that in the farms they didn't necessarily have a good supply of potable water. And milk became associated with urbanization with disease and illness. And that's what John found with his article, was that people were taking him to task over the fact that he was encouraging the return of ghastly contagious diseases that would annihilate us all. I'm sorry, but that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> they have a history of it to the extreme. <laughs> now, there is an element of truth about this, and there's an amazing book, Tyler, would you hold it up? Has uh, anybody seen this book? It's called The Untold Story of Milk. It's an absolutely riveting, good, rather long read about that, the true and interesting history around the milk. And what happened was, was that farms didn't have good water. Commercial operatives, middlemen, were selling milk uh, unscrupulously and, uh, and um, uh, contaminating it by using chalk or by... Well, what they were trying to do was to get it to market without it spoiling, without refrigeration, without mass transportation. And therefore, they were doing whatever it took to sell the milk. So it was watered down. It then created an atmosphere anxiety, but, but mothers were still desperate for the milk, but they fed the milk to their children. And there was a lot of illness, whether it was diphtheria, whether it was cholera, whether it was TB. And I want to make absolutely clear that what then took place was a necessary evil to counter a transitional period in man's history between urbanization and through so uncontrolled urbanization, as we see now in other parts of the world, and the establishment of standards and food standards, okay, and the establishment of controls. So now we're around about the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century, and as you all know, when the soldiers were sent off to Boer War, they found they were absolutely useless soldiers because they were all weak 
because these were men who come from the cities who had such poor diet. So that's when that started, the consciousness around public health came in and controlling food quality and safety. It was decided that pasteurization invented by my not great friend, Louis Pasteur, uh, annihilating bacteria indiscriminately, or microbes indiscriminately, would be a convenient way to allow for farmers to continue doing what they were doing, giving better um, security and um, safety for the end consumer. But they all knew at the time that it was not the same substance as the raw milk of the place. It's not the same food. I challenge you, you take a bottle of raw milk and you pour it into a basin in this weather, and you take a bottle of pasteurized milk of any description, modified pasteurized pour it into a vessel and you leave it for seven days. What will happen to the pasteurized or homogenized milk? It will putrefy. It stinks. You wouldn't put it in your thought. You wouldn't have it in your house. The raw milk will do what? It'll, it'll curd. It'll, it'll sour. It'll go to curds and whey, essentially. You can drink the whey because you're all bodybuilders, and you can eat the curds because you all love cheese. Okay, that's the balance of the bacteria. So the, the, what pasteurization does is it indiscriminately destroys um, good and bad bacteria to create an imbalance. Just in the same way as you'll see food putrefying, it will putrefy, that's why fermentation comes along from the carbon there. It's all in that more, but we all know more, more about fermentation anyway because it's the new hot topic. Um, so we're now in a situation where, as a temporary measure, and it was acknowledged by the scientists at the time that it was a temporary measure, but it was necessary to allow for the uh, quality of the, of the food, uh, security of the milk to be, because they couldn't get every single farmer, could they? They couldn't make every single farmer, and uh, they couldn't get their act together with every single farmer. It was much cheaper to centralize it, control it from a central proposition until the farmers could catch up with their own hygiene standards. And then, this was largely the start of the demise of the dairy farm, because it encouraged the establishment of dairies. So they then became a middleman between the dairy human, the, the farmer, and the consumer. And what happens is that you'll see bulk tankers going around the countryside, picking up milk from all the farms, so you get a small board of milk into a tanker, goes to the dairy, it's pasteurized, which is heat treated, homogenized, which means often that the fat is then smashed up so that it doesn't separate, because heaven forbid you wouldn't want to breathe in the top of your milk, would you? That would be weird. So, they smash it up and they turn it into a, a into this um, blended substance called a moisturized pasteurized milk. And that is what we have now, that's our legacy, is that nobody reversed it because the economic trends around the dairy industry were around the power was vested in the dairies. Okay? The transfer of power went to the dairies. The dairyman now is Tarly and uh, 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 David Rosie will tell you, dairies, dairymen, Farmers are price takers, not price makers. And the big revolution in our time today is, in fact, Dave coming up to, to um, Nottingham Market and also to Parks in North London every week, Tarly selling to a farm shop in Forest Grove. They're price makers. But of course, they're constrained by the average value of milk in the supermarkets, and there is obviously a limit to that which people will pay because we can set an artificially low price for milk. So the demise of the, of the dairy, of, sorry, of the farm, of the dairy farmer, is around the commercial interest of the dairies. And now, at farm gate, you get 26 pence a litre, 27, 30 pence a litre, 30 pence a litre. 28. 28. 28. And but, what but, do you... but we're at the Channel Island rate, so yeah. that's so not you, my you, personal copy so, so what is your cost of production? Yeah, okay, but let's say <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, not, it's it's not, not, it's not, it isn't far off. It really isn't far off. Okay. So we're in, a, we're in a, a death spiral of the small dairy farm. And uh, I think in Poland, the average size of dairy farm in Poland is about six or seven <coughs> per cattle. The, 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 herd, the, the herd size is about six to ten. In this country, it's probably about 812 now, I think. So something like that. So what we've seen is the demise of the small family units and the growth of the bigger herds that then feed the dairy is to bring you this mixed milk, which you can't is mixed. So um, what you see now is only the differentiation between skim, semi-skim, or fat. 
What is the fastest growing dairy sector in this country today? Raw milk sales. It's a good news story. It's a really good news story. And it's really important that we challenge our preconceptions about milk to understand what this anxiety is about around milk. It's a historical anxiety that is now um, misunderstood. I will tell you now that it is impossible to get TB, human TB, from milk unless somebody with TB contagious spits into the milk or transfers the contagion to the milk. You can get bovine TB, which I believe is called in the dairy industry cowman's lung or cowman's flu. Is that right? That was the traditional one. That was the one called. And bovine TB is not fatal. It is it is like a mild dose of flu, and you either take antibiotics or you shrug it off because you're used to being with the cow. And I'm not going to talk much about TB today because I'm going to let Tali tell that story, or Dave's, and you can ask questions to them. They, as farmers, are TB tested rigorously, and it's what we're looking for here is bovine TB, okay? not human TB. It does not exist in the UK herd. So it's a nonsense to talk about TB being the hysteria because there are two types of TB. The, um, we in this country uh, have become naive about milk and cream and cheeses in the sense that the Swiss probably have, what, 200 different raw milk cheeses, 240 different raw milk cheeses, all sorts of saying. We know this, we all know this as a group. Uh, the, um, the plethora of raw milk cheeses outside this country. And the renaissance of raw milk cheeses in this country is to be afforded as well. As I say, Tali is here. So what goes on now is that we've seen the emerging interest in raw milk based on the, on the principles that I've described to you, which is all about seeking true nourishment, balance the nutrient and um, uh, uh, bacterial originality in our milk to, give, to allow us to thrive and our, 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 for our health to be supported when we can tolerate milk. Now, the um, situation that we find ourselves in is that um, we, we have a totally, um, how can I describe this, uh, over-indexing uh, safety regulatory body that looks after the standards of raw milk to the extreme. Whereas at the other extreme, um, and in Wisconsin they call dairy, uh, they, they call milk dirty water, you've got the ability to be able to produce milk and they know it's going to be safe because you can pasteurize it. So you've got this polarization between raw milk and pasteurized milk. And what this means is that when Dave goes to his market at Notting Hill, he is vouching for the integrity of that milk. And the, the law allows Dave to sell to each one of us, face to face, person to person, <coughs> from the farm gate or as a representative of the farm at the market or one of his representatives. Correct? That is the law on raw milk. The law is such an ass that Dave could supply raw cream butter to Sainsbury's and they could sell it. So this is the complexity around this subject matter. And you could supply raw cream to a supermarket or a you know, any third party retailer with, uh, with computer computer. <coughs> but there is this whole uh, emotional anxiety around raw milk. So what we're going to do this evening is to challenge that through the conversations that we're going to have. But fundamentally, as Hattie says, we're going to challenge it through the tasting. Because I have run two tutor, blind tutor tastings at the Gabelli Food Festival about three or four years ago. Was anybody there? You were there, Dave. Okay. So two years in a row, I ran blind raw milk tutor tastings with 60 people. John Blyman came once, one of our members, and it was a sensational event because it opened people's eyes to the most important aspect of is the freedom to have access to raw milk and then to enjoy the milk in all of its flavor complexities. So what we're looking at this evening is that we have this unique, we have this unique opportunity to taste not only raw milk, but raw milk specifically from breeds of cattle. And this is where our, uh, our, uh, our right to have that choice is of paramount importance to be able to seek the, the exquisite flavors of the different fat contents 
in the milk that we're going to try today. So who here drinks semi-sweet milk? Drinks semi-sweet milk. Okay. Now this is interesting because when I did the tasting and after it doesn't mean you're sinners or you're wrong, you know. <laughs> this sense of the flavor profile of milk that you buy is down to the fat content. So that was yours is zero, and then semi spin milk is two, 2.2. And then full fat milk, the fat content is 3.5. 3.5? Three point five. Three point five. Three point five. Yeah. OK? And so what they do is the Standardized. Standardized, yes, indeed. OK. So um, I also want to touch upon the fact that I went to an FSA gathering you were there, Tiny, weren't you? There was a great gathering all about security, milk security, and should the FSA get involved in more legislation or controlling or ban it? Scotland, they ban raw milk. The best thing I've ever done is win the World Porridge Championship and dosing that bowl of porridge with <laughs> raw cream and cooking it with raw milk, and it won. Uh, one in the eye for you know, uh, uh, against the Scottish Senate, whatever. Um, and um, so they banned it in Scotland. Where else they banned it? They banned it in Northern Ireland. No, in no, Ireland. No, no. No, Ireland. We're on the talks, so aren't they? That's right. Interesting. So there's, there's polarisation of opinion, but in Scotland it's banned. And what um, is interesting is that when we go to this FSA talk, there's about 50 people there. Was that one of the most stirring moments in the whole talk was a that nobody unwittingly consumes raw milk. You can't go and buy it from your local. So you actually have to make the personal decision to buy raw milk, and that means that you are culpable, liable, and you are having a, a, a handshake with the farmer. Fantastic bacterial handshake, good. <laughs> Increased bacterial diversity, lots of oral sensing. Or good. My next book. Anyway, so um, what we're doing here is that we're, we're making a conscious decision. Don't take it away from us. Secondly, we're doing it because we actually do it because we love. Sensation. So I think without much ado, you're happy with that. We'll yep. get on with some tasting. So what we're going to do first of all, I'm going to talk to you about this, the reason why the milks are the way they are. The first milk we're going to taste, what I would describe as the most commoditized, and that's the problem with milk, it's become commoditized. And commodities and food don't go, are not great benefits. Flavor goes out the window, and so does nutritional quality. We've seen this, and that's what's corrupting our health is the commoditization of food. So, what we're going to try now, um, can we try the skimmed essential and the semi skimmed? And then the essential um, full fat. So, when I was laughing about semi skimmed and skimmed milk, <coughs> I'm laughing, making, a, making a comment about it, is that skimmed milk, um, of course, Rather like that uh, breakfast cereal that if you wore a red dress, yeah, you could have your skin on. You could have the red dress. You have to remember that as a disappeared. It's pretty it's disappeared. I mean, it must have been true. You could say it. You could red dress on skin. if you're drinking skin milk and eating that cereal. Well, skin milk has had a fat. So there is no satiety on fat. And all you've got left is the lactose. And what makes you fat? The lactose. So if anybody thinks that skim milk is going to make you skinny, you are being led to the um, you, you are being mis you are being misguided, misled, misinformed. Now this is a I'm assuming I think it's British. It's um so this is picked up from a variety of different farms. This skim milk picked up right from farms, and it's then uh, all blended together. This, this milk rather. It's then taken to the dairy, and in times past, what they would do is that the first thing they do is they essentially drop the cream, and you'd have to skim milk. And then, do you remember the day when you had your milk bottles, and there'd be that wedge of cream on the top? And if you try to pour it out, it would go in the your cereal, and the children would go, that's disgusting, because it's got this blob of cream. That's because what they did was that they separated the uh, skim milk from the cream, and then dosed the cream back to suit the type of milk they were selling. And that was the reason that they did that, because it meant it was uh, 
uh, cheap and easy to do. And then what's the profit in the dairy? Cream. Okay. They put just the right amount of cream in all your commoditized, standardized, cheap milk that they are required by law, no more, because they keep the remainder to sell as cream and butter. Oh dear. So we're missing out on flavor and we're missing out on the quality of the nutrients. So, skin milk, no fat, lots of lactose, brilliant. It's the last thing you need to be on the diet, mm -hmm. skin milk. Okay? They feed pig skin milk to make yeah, fat. Yeah. The traditional yes. farmers would feed pig skin milk to fat. Yes. <laughs> but not that I'm comparing anyone. Who <laughs> <laughs> drinks skin milk? <laughs> but it is, it is, you know, we all know, I mean, if, you're, if you're in the Big Fat Surprise, or you've all seen that book, it's the most amazing book to read about the whole lipid hypothesis being a load of old tosh. Okay? And unfortunately, we're being unshackled from this appalling regime of anti fat, fat fear, and so on. So skim milk has its place, I don't know where, except in a pig. Okay, because it's great for fat. Now, some of us don't like the flavour of milk, that it's, it's, um, that it's got more fat in it. So the next milk you're going to have is a semi skim milk. Is that, or has that already gone out? No, this is the semi skim This is the semi skim milk. Now, this, what we're doing here is that this is a homogenised milk, so is, so is the skim milk. So, did I explain clearly enough the difference between what's in effect separating the cream and then combining the cream? So, homogenisation. Just so you know how, how glorious uh, uh, dairies are looking after our well-being. They take the milk and they will fire the milk through a micro sieve at high pressure to smash up the fat particles so that they then sit in suspension in the milk. So when you see homogenization, when you see homogenized on the side of your carton, that means that it's been the fat particles have been smashed up to make them unnaturally small. So they then sit in suspension in the milk. So that's where I find it really disturbing. Look at the colour of this milk. It's white. Milk isn't white. Milk is off-white. And there's nothing more terrifying than going along a, uh, in, in a supermarket and seeing ranks of, of milk bottles all optical white. I find it really disturbing. And that's because it's all homogenized. And then, ah, oh, there's a, uh, a jersey with this gold top bottle. Ah, oh, goodness, there's um, something worth drinking almost in the supermarket. So you're having semi-skim milk, which legally they have to put in uh, 2.2 thereabouts. So they put in exactly 2.2, dosed it to exactly the right amount. In the old days, as I say, they would squirt it on the top, and then you'd have this separation. But no, homogenization to stop that. Disgusting, weird, natural thing. Cream, and it's blended. The next we're going to try is uh, the full fat, which, of course, when you think of full fat, you think, oh, that must be 20% fat, you know, like, <laughs> three, so much, really full of fat, nonsense, it's 3.3% fat, yeah. but it's pasteurized and it's homogenized. So this is fully commoditized substance, uh, which some of us, I mean, you could argue, I can't really call this milk. It's, it's, it has its place as a semi, I mean, what's interesting, in fact, is that the life of this milk is no greater than the life of raw milk. I buy raw milk on a Saturday at Notting Hill Market, and I'm still drinking it the next Saturday, and it's being enriched. But there is no um, reason that uh, one should be buying this for long right? Um any comments so far on these milks? Any any sort of preferences, thoughts? So they said it's much better than the skin. Yeah. 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 Some flavour. Yeah. And this is, I think, what struck everybody at Abu Ghabi was that any of you put their hands up, getting skimmed and sorry, skimmed and semi skimmed. Actually, through the blind tasting, I will reveal to you they chose the fattiest milks. Yeah. Okay? Because of the flavour. They wanted the flavour. Now what you're not getting in any of this milk is the nuances <coughs> of the breed of the cow. You couldn't tell what that was. I mean, you know, there could be Jersey in there, there could be Friesen and Holstein. I mean, predominantly the national herd is predominantly Friesen and Friesen Holstein for, um, in terms of production. So the next milk we're going to come on to are the organic, the Dutchy organic, the reason we've chosen, we chose, it's not the way um, uh, they're our biggest customer. But actually because, um, <laughs> so it's a bit of a payback, but actually just they're very convenient because they're across the river. I walked across the river to get them today. 
So what the next thing we're going to try now, is the next thing we're going to try is the gut sheet, which there, it's their acute way of saying it's not homogenized. So they don't homogenize their organic milk. Do you all know that? So you should see the cream rise at the top of this milk, which you will do. And they do skimmed, semi-skimmed, and uh, full fat. But it is pasteurized. It is pasteurized, but not homogenized. It's pasteurized, but not homogenized. And then the final milk we're going to taste before I hand over to Dave to, to begin with is going to be a gold top. Do you all know what gold top stands for in the sense of the Greek variety? It is the Guernsey the cow, or cows, or mixture of Guernsey and Jersey usually. And what's bizarre is that one of the greatest aspects of gold top is that you've got that. So these Guernsey and Jersey cows have got higher fat in their milk than the other breeds. Okay. So you will see that lovely rich golden fat on the top. And what certain uh, dairies have come to is they actually homogenize gold top. Which when I saw that it was like a big insult to you know a high fat milk you've ever seen. In other words they smash up the particles so that you don't need to have that ghastly cream on the top of your gold top is now accommodated within so um, that's what we'll do in terms of the pasteurizing. And so then we're going to get turn to, to the um, dairy farms to tell their story and to taste their milk. So I'd like I'd be fascinated to, see, to hear whether you find any difference between the uh skim not homogenized, pasteurized. So it's not the milk from hydro then. No. This, I believe, is just the uh, blended organic milk. So it's skimmed. Now, I want to reassure you that all your little cups are made of potatoes. So they will biodegrade uh, in your compost. And we never, it, we were the first, uh, there's an amazing company out there called Vegware. But Bedgeware is quite looking the mark. Bedgeware is a classic success story in British uh, style. They um, produce biodegradable, they produce biodegradable um, uh, cups and plates and, uh, and they're made of potato and stuff. So if any of you have any relationships with any catering or any food service, and I do this around the world, I'm Bedgeware's biggest salesperson. We gave them their first ever order of the company to sell when we were very small. I wouldn't use wooden spoons and I was going to use plastic cups. And these are um, made of potato cups. And then we're going to have the semi skimmed and then we'll have the full fat. So, any questions while we're waiting for the next round of events? Um, now, the gold top, it can vary seasonally, but in theory it can go from, so the fattiest milk, correct if I'm wrong, in a, in a, in a bovine world is probably Jersey, isn't it? Yeah. 5.3 maximum, something like that, 5.8, 6, six. six. Yeah. but there's a tipping, you'll discover there's an incredible tipping point between you know, 4.3 and 5.6, it's not, does, it's not linear. It actually it seems to me that the, the sensory um, uh, joy increases exponentially with a small amount of increments in fat within the milk. Buffalo, correct me if I'm wrong. Anybody here know about buffalo? Buffalo is 20. I think it's much higher. It's something like 22 percent, which is why buffalo makes such great yogurt in uh, Asia. Uh, so, and horse, I think, is I think horse is H. You can buy a horse at um, mare's milk in um, uh, pharmacies in France. And they say you can buy donkey milk in pharmacies in um, So, we have no idea whether this is an A2 milk or an A1 milk. It's, but in America, for instance, A1 milk is the predominant milk. And what's absolutely clear is that the uh, anxiety around milk, there, it's incredibly complex. Why Rupel sells a lot of almond drink? We sell a lot of almond drink. Okay, because people are making choices to not have dairy. Yeah, here I am banging on about 
more on that. So I believe in producing the best non-dairy, and I believe in promoting the best of dairy. And the reason that people choose, uh, how often now people would go to the doctor and they would say, cut out gluten, cut out dairy. That's the sort of default position, isn't it? Which is rather pathetic, because it's rather more complex than that. Some of us are actually, as we get older, and did you want to you will know this, as we get older, we lose our lactose, our ability to, to digest lactose because we produce less lactase. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a function of growing old that we become less tolerant of milk. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So that's why children often you know, go and drink guzzle of milk, and then as they get older, they drink less milk. Mm -hmm. Beer, or vodka, or whatever it is that mm -hmm. teenagers do. <laughs> um, so, what we're seeing here is this confusion around, are you um, intolerant of lactose? Are you intolerant of A1 lipoprotein? Or are you, are you just getting old? Does that make sense? I mean, so how can you possibly know the difference between those two, except for the person? No, I could not drink milk. I love the person. I used to be forced to still Because I went on the raw milk diet. No, I, never, I've always um, But what I did was that I could not really, in, I didn't enjoy a glass of milk. How many of you drink a glass of milk every day? No. Okay, I drink one more or less every night, or, and I'll make dairy kefir, and I will look forward to coming away from a trip to having guzzling down a glass of Hurtlebrook milk, or floor hatch milk, or raw milk. Because to me, I can still digest it, I'm enriched by it. So for 20 years I didn't drink milk, and as a child I did, and then I returned to milk drinking through my uh, relationship with raw milk. And I think that you will find this evening that you may be surprised to just see, feel the difference intrinsically with raw milk. Is that all? We've got gold top to go. Mm -hmm. Is that the last one? Is gold top? There's an endless gold top and then another one. It doesn't really matter. They're both the same as long as they're not homogenized. So we have to thank um, our team from. Uh, which help is Emily, and there's Libby, and it's Elle, and they work with me in the office, so they're uh, really kind of helping the evening volunteers to bring us uh, these milks. So this um, uh, shift to, to uh, um, uh, demonize dairy, I would argue, is, is through ill, uh, through <laughs> misunderstanding, and ill-conceived um, um, uh, appreciation for milk and its, in its purest form. Because what we're doing is we're drinking milk that we were never designed to, to actually drink. So what we do know is that when you homogenize milk, you make the fat particles so small, and no, nobody's ever tested it. Nobody's ever said, nobody ever said to the dairy industry, have you ever tested whether homogenizing milk is safe? Nobody's ever, nobody ever did that. They introduced um, homogenization without any consultation. It just arrived because it was commercially convenient. It's an important story. And now they're beginning to realize that, in fact, it's, some of us are passing through our gut wall, and it's actually harmful to us. So what we have here is a situation where they knew, back in the uh, early part of the 20th century, that pasteurization was a necessary evil for a short period of time. And then not only did they continue with pasteurization, but they then they introduced this other uh, um, alien substance called homogenized cream, or homogenized milk. So no wonder our bodies are no wonder we're, we're, we're actually thinking about being allergic. I'm, I'm, um, I'm finding myself not able to tolerate that. And so therefore people switch to almond drink. Now at the end of the day, they have never ever analyzed what is in milk. Nobody in the scientific community has ever analyzed the true nutritional profile of milk. It's just too complex. It's just an extraordinarily complex substance, particularly when it's raw. So if you are going to have almond drink and Fortunately, we don't get many calls like this saying, almond drink, can I feed it to my baby instead of milk? I'm serious. I do know producers who have that call. Is it, should I give my baby almond drink? Almond milk. Well, the, the health and the nutritional properties of milk, whatever you call it, the nutritional properties of almond milk are almonds and water. Get it? It's not milk. It's not a food. So, we must be very careful here and not it's not a replacement, it's an alternative for reasons of dietary um, uh, necessity or dietary uh, desire.
Right, so what we need to do now is to move on before I bang on any longer. So I'd like to now ask if any comments on where we are so far. So you've moved up the chain and we're now ending with the, um, this is what's known as gold top, channel island milk, widely available, pasteurized, don't buy the homogenized one, so I shouldn't say that. Don't buy the one, well, you might not want to buy the one that is but this is simply pasteurized and is usually from Jersey and Guernsey cattle. So as I said, this is an incredibly complex issue subject, so we're going to move straight on to Dave and Rosie. So let's have Dave and Rosie come and talk about that. Any favourites so far of the, of the milks? The last one? So Rosie now, um, so, Rosie and Dave are farmers from here, back here in Somerset. And so Dave, uh, every Saturday morning, drives 130 miles up to Rocking Hill to sell his water. Over to you. Right. You've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sent out here. Dave does all the chats on a Saturday morning and I stick over the farm. Um, Herdebrook, we are based in the, in the Blackmore Vale, which is just south of Shetland Mallet, north of Yeovil in Somerset, the Dorset border. It's a beautiful, beautiful vale. And we're called Herdbrook because our cows, we're petting the cows, we've got all the breed and they're not anymore, and they're Herdbrook, and Herdbrook is a field. So if anybody wants to know, a hurdle is what we hold your sheep back with, and it's over the brook. So years ago, some people to hurdle over the brook, because they're down in that field of now, Dave is third generation. We have two more, hopefully, waiting for weeks when Dave is the fourth generation of farmers at home. We've not, we're not new raw milk producers. We've been producing raw milk, right? Dave has been producing raw milk since the 80s. I've like grown in from North Sunset, so I've been a long way to find <laughs> And together, we've pushed this idea of raw milk. Um, we are fans. We started very slowly, we started doing a few local farmers markets, and they could often stand all day and sell a few pounds of milk. And slowly, slowly, slowly we started to realise there was things going on outside. And to begin with, you piggybacked, didn't you, with the other farmer in Bad Perry, and two of them went down to London. And I remember Charlie, Dave was late one morning and Charlie left. And I was going up at three or three and I'm clapping with Dave and that was already in this chill and I got into London by day. The two little girls in the van, came o'clock in the morning, to desperately catch him up and we caught him up. But over the years, you successfully built up a really good law business because Dave is a very good salesman. Chats <laughs> 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 are ladies that on a Saturday, I believe. I've never been. <laughs> You've been in the market for how many years? 18, 19 years? 19, yeah. 19, yeah, 18, 19 years, and we've never, I've never been. <laughs> so at home we milk 220 guns, we've well, got 220 guns cows in the herd. We have a split block, so we would have what like a, a spring calving herd and a water calving herd, so we can get a nice even profile of milk for the retail. And we push the grass space business, so we're producing milk from grass for as long as we can. We get lots of questions. Your cow carries graze grass 12 months a year. And we say, well, no, well, why not? <laughs> there's soil conditions and there's animal welfare. Our soil is as important to us as our cows. Soil is living, it's important, and we really have to value it. So you don't go tramping the fields in the winter unless you're going to reseed or do something else in the spring. So we, our cows will come in in the autumn as the weather dictates. So during the summer they'll be out night and day and they'll be grazing 100%. Come the autumn, we'll bring them in by night as the weather turns and they'll go out by day and then they may only go out for the morning and they come in. And then they'll be a short, be a for the shortest period possible. We have managed about two and a half months, haven't we? Three months this year was dreadfully long. Um, we had that attack and then the month on was that we did go out to the 4th of April this year and the earliest we went out was the 19th of February. 
So that tells you it was been a very, very hard year for dairy farmers this year. Um, so we would keep them in over winter. So they're in day and night. We fed them on straw. They have a really cushy life. They run lots of all 10 yards of food. That, but you can guarantee as soon as that sun starts shining in the spring, they are waiting at the gate. And if you, you open the wrong gate for the yard and they hear that once and it's that familiar front, they're all there. Well, let's go. So what we've done also is we've put tracks out over the farm so we can get the cows away and back without damaging the soil, without getting the cows dirty, without causing problems. So they're out grazing pastures. And what Nick sort of, sort of touched on was about how milk varies. Milk can vary. We're tasting different milks here, but we can detect a difference in milk. As, as cows graze the farm and they've got different forages and slightly different things going on in their diet. So there's a change when the cows come in in the winter onto silage, which is a, grass, a pickle grass basically, so a sauerkraut for cows. It's a pickle grass, um, and then I wouldn't have that, the small amount of um, energy and protein balance, so they're not locked in the cake if you give them non GM at the moment, but there is organic conversion, so that will change your feed fully organic. So we are pushing for that beautiful grass-based milk. We want variants, we want seasonal variants, we want a cream. I'm shaking this up. Mm. Nick, have you got one there? Have you got a jersey you to put next? Yes, I have, yes. Yeah, yeah. What I'd like to point out is our poor old Guernsey cows actually have got a failing, which is quite good. We all think yes, you, can see that. you all think that the jersey is the creamy yellow milk and the Guernsey is the same, but it's not. My Guernsey cows at home are very inefficient at digesting beta carotene. So what you get is a yellower milk and also a flavour from the carotene, those big carrots. This is higher fat content. Yes. So yellowness does not equate to fat. So and they're near, they'll, they'll be things. within a percent. Yeah. But it, it's quite a big thing. And how much, does the, how much does the fat content vary throughout the year? We would, <laughs> we would get a slight seasonal variance, wouldn't we? But Maybe when we turn out initially, you would drop it. If they were on lush grass, yeah. then the, the fat content would be less. Uh, fiber drives fat content. We think hay, so if not, hay would yeah, keep you fatter. If you've got a lot of hay, fat content would not keep you fatter. So, yeah, so the grass being, as it's growing, will be lush, so the fat content is more. And as it goes through the summer, it dries out a bit. And there is this sense of the pastures, I mean, you're, in, you're organic in conversion, mm -hmm. and there's also that sense of the, the pasture association, pasture, yes. which is a big trend in America, whether it's beef, whether it's chickens out for pastured chickens, pastured eggs, or hatch, for instance, they differentiate between pastured eggs and, and the eggs from layers that have been fed, processed food, as it were, yeah. feed. Well, what we're trying to, what, what we're promoting here is cows that are eating Fine to. I mean, there's something really quite magical which man has never been able to emulate. It's to take grass and turn it into plants. It's really quite hard to do, even though we've got all the science in the world. That's magic. And a cow does that. It produces protein for humans on ground, but we can't produce protein in another way. We can't eat it. We can't eat it. So when people say cows are methane producing waste of time, they're not. They're actually producing a protein that we can eat off the land. So that's the land where, go grass. And then again, you can see the different colours of them. So going yellow up, less yellow. And that actually does, this is a little bit confusing to be say because higher fat, slightly less, and then lower fat. So we'll, we'll, we'll come on to this. But equally, we all have unique flavours. We'll have something that's going on. So what else, what else am I meant to talk about? Well, that's it. That's it. I'm done. Well, that's it. <laughs>
Foster Island. Yeah. 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 Quite, 
I think in terms of health and everything, um, you know, they don't. They're hardy. They're hardy, and, and you do, they don't milk off their backs. Meaning that if um, with with more moderate of power, then if you um, if you don't feed them high input, then and you keep milking them, you'll you'll basically then you'll be milking their body away. Um, so and the <laughs> and the, 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 the life of an intensively farmed dairy cow is three, five, six, seven years. Six, six years is for yeah. the average. And um, yours? Uh, oh, 10 to 16. 16. 10 to 16. Yeah, we've got a 16 year old at the moment who's uh, literally going out to pasture with their calf. Which is I think that's a very big welfare well issue there as well. Yeah. yeah. The other aspect is in terms of waste, if you're holding a glass bottle. Yeah, so we, we use reusable glass bottles um, and um, washing in between. Um, and that's that's obviously more work than using plastic bottles. Um, and it's something that we're able to do because we sell to our local community. But I think it's something that's quite appreciated, especially all the stuff that's coming out about plastics now. Um, we're, we're slowly looking into how to do glass yogurt pots as well, um, which we currently do in plastic. Um, but um, yeah, foil hand. caps and everything, this is the milk and yeah. And it, that, that's all done by hand. So all yeah. the caps are done by hand. So. We have so. a little thing, a yes, uh, bottle cap, which we do <laughs> individually. So yeah, it's, Anyway. And how many of you are qualified to well, qualify to uh, um, uh, actually help with the milking? So, um, um, you do it? We've got, I think there's three of us at the moment. One, one of our other actors, his, his wife has had a baby, so he's on this one. So, he's a joint effort and on your side, Dave, you've got one person. Well, yeah, we've got one person. 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 Yeah, we've got so it's um, morning and night throughout the year, so some farms try to switch to it one, one once a day. day. So imagine that, morning and night.
uh, uh, when I'm, say, on holiday in another part of the country, I will find out by Googling natural, whatever it's called, raw milk finder, and finding out where the nearest raw milk farm is, and then I will go and support that raw, farm, raw milk producer by going and buying from the farm gate. So I encourage you, you know, I encourage you very much to support farmers, because here what we're tasting is the unique taste of this, um, the grass on this farm with these cows. Now there's Friesian in there as well, and Friesian is the uh, milk machine of uh, commoditized dairy. <laughs> And they are uh, the highest yield alongside uh, the Friesian Holstein. And as you know, the um, dairy cattle that have been pushed to their limit, the gaunt, big udder, and they don't do the dairy industry any favors in terms of how people might uh, view this as being um, not good for animal welfare. Interestingly enough, in fact, when you have a cow such as a dual breed cow or a cow that's been um, with a high welfare at the dairy cow, uh, they, uh, they don't look that cool. They're not built to have a huge udder. They're actually a much more balanced animal. And interesting enough, as you saw, Rick Stein has been promoting, hasn't he, dairy beef. And there's a whole story behind dairy beef and eating dairy beef and the fantastic flavors of dairy beef. So that's another story for another taste. And that is because, in fact, what you'll find is that the dairy cattle, their muscle is marbled with much more fat than the beefy beef, uh, the actual meat varieties, Aberdeen Angus, which I won't eat. You know, I'm looking for meat that is marbled for the right reasons. So dairy beef, whether it's retired dairy beef, look up RTB, RTB. Retired dairy beef. There's a whole world out there where they're now beginning to sell retired dairy beef, and it's absolutely delicious. And as I say, it's been promoted by um, some. Uh, now, some, I'm, some I'm going to interrupt because I think people want to get towards the butters and the creams as well. Um, I also there 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 are issues about raw milk, um, and I spoke to. Professor Hugh Pennington, who's a microbiologist, who's based in Scotland, where they banned raw milk. And I have a sort of quite a balanced statement, which I don't think I have time to read out here, but we can post it to people. But very broadly, so he says the risks are the same for milk and cream, but not as much so because the bugs tend to die off during processing. The main concerns aren't actually TB. Uh, but Campylobacter, E. coli, 1.7, and Salmonella. So these are the things which you guys are having to, you know, look after. Now, the reason it's been banned in Scotland, he said, was the potential severity of these. Is because of the potential severity. It's it's um it was banned in 1983, and it's likely to remain illegal there because. Food Safety Scotland say there have been 12, quote, potentially associated deaths. So if it goes wrong, it can be very bad. And that's because of the particular kinds of food poisoning. Um, the recorded outbreaks, this is interesting. He said were from failures of pasteurisation rather than raw milk, dedicated raw milk supplies, which I thought was very interesting. So he said that. Uh, it was where people normally pasteurised and their pasteurisation process had gone wrong. So they weren't milking in order to sell it pasteurised. Um, so it all said raw? It all said raw, yes. Yeah. Um, so those are the three issues. Um, TB, uh, we've already covered that. And the easiest and best way to get rid of bovine TB is to pasteurise the milk. He said that pasteurisation pasteurization wasn't introduced necessarily for food safety, but to give it a longer shelf life. That was his um, comment. And that raw milk cheeses, the risk of raw milk cheese, is less for mature cheeses, as the cheese making process salt acid acidification negates the risk of bugs, particularly E. coli. People probably worked out hundreds of years ago that they could mature raw meat, milk, and cheese. So we can send that to anyone who's interested. And I, I don't know if this is a chance to ask the farmers any questions uh, about safety and
and um, you know bacterial counts because E. coli is the one that they are most worried about, which is basically because you can get it's a, as I said it's a manure. So it's your enterose. It's like it's yeah. It's, like yeah. it's a it's a, a manure to mouth. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry to put it that way. But our would say it's a shit to magazines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's basically yeah. what it is. Very scientific. Yeah. Your enterose. Yeah. So as small milk supplies, how do you ensure? We have a very rigorous milk community that most dairy farmers will stick to in such a in such a rigorous way because they know their milk is going to be pasteurised. And they probably only got to kind of do a batch of the cake. It depends on the other five, 30 or 50. As long as they come in and they're there, they won't be penalised. We're trying to keep our batteries in much lower than that. So we would start, we start with everybody who's looking wearing gloves, not to protect themselves, but to protect the cows from the staph aureus, from the staph aureus carriers. So we're not going to infect any cycling or cuts from us onto the cow. We pre dip with iodine. So each cow has this spray with iodine and then wiped with an individual paper towel so you're not contaminated with the cow. And there's a quick little flip you learn so that you're using a different side of the paper to each quarter. So you've really got a clean edit before you start with the surgical At that point you're also taking a little bit of the four milk so you can expect the four milk to be a watery, bloody if you've got a bruised quarter or clots, or just that instinct that something's not quite right and it's hard and you're poor. So you pick all that up as you're milking, it's just an innate thing as you're, you're examining the cow, because each cow you go to milk, you see a herd, you see them walk in, so each one's getting that, I don't know, just, you just know, you just know because you're looking at them all, you're not looking at your fingernails, you're actually looking at the cows that they come in. And most cows will come in in the same place in every yeah. yeah. So, so she hangs one back. Thing, one hangs back and she'll come in the first yeah. place. And you get to know, like you milk a cut herd for a week, you start to know the people who are getting fat under. Yeah, that's it. It's your. It's, your, it's part of being a stockman. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's a gut instinct that something's not right. You just There is just a gut instinct. But, but you are examined more rigorously than conventional. Yeah, yeah. Types there. You, are, you are examined how often? Are you inspected how often? What we have, what, our, our raw milk? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hang on, but hang on before that. So we also yeah. spray the udder afterwards because the tea orifice opens and takes about 20 minutes, the sphincter muscle, to close after milking. So we spray with an iodine spray afterwards so that should anything get on that tea orifice in that 20 minutes, there's iodine there to prevent any infection again. We're inspected by the Food Standards Agency unannounced every three months. We take our own testing. Um, our bulk milk that goes off to our cheese makers tested every day and they refer to something that was something wrong. And who else takes milk? Oh, the, um, the, the AHO will come in and announce and inspect or... That's the environmental health. Oh yeah, environmental health will come in and announce and inspect and take samples. So we are open for an announced inspections at all times. And that wouldn't same. happen to a conventional no. dairy farmer at all? The Food Standards Agency or to the dairy hygiene, I think it's got to be at least once in 10 years. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not as bad as it sounds. Because we all are members to sell your milk anywhere. You have to be a member of the Red Tractor scheme. You can get away from that because you're just doing all the rain. But the Red Tractor is has sort of taken over a lot of that. So the inspection takes over a lot of that. So they're inspecting the fabric of your building, your records, your medicines. So that you are being inspected once a year on that. But it's not in the same rigorous way. I could become a red transfer inspector I'm tomorrow. I'm not qualified in any bacterial way. The environmental health have got their degrees and they know what they're looking for and they're trained. Um, talking about a nice bacterial handshake, but some of this milk is now sold by in uh, venue Oh, yeah. Not in this. Yes, I think there is a There's a rule. Oh, question is, if they're now 118 raw milk producers, and I know that the FSA title, can you tell us about 
talk about the possible uh, bringing yeah. together of a... So, um, so in recent years, so the, the Food Standards Agency reviewed the controls and model uh, in a, a huge three-year thing which culminated in 2015 and basically decided to keep things pretty much as they were at the time um, because there wasn't really anything showing um, that anything was changing in the situation with raw milk. Now there's, there is a growing interest in it from consumers and there's an interest in, uh, a growing number of producers. More milk is sold each year. So, um, so the Food Standards Agency are reviewing it again. Um, and I think we're going to have their decision in, in June. Um, with, I think it's likely to lead to some tightening up of controls even further. Um, and possible more restrictions on sales. Um, and, um, and sort of in response to all this going on and the fact that the number of raw milk producers is growing, uh, there was a meeting last week between the Food Science Agency and um, raw milk producers and um, some, some listening to you know different sides of things, but um, I think out of that is going to come a raw milk producer organisation um, so that raw milk producers can um, help support each other and especially the, the new um, organisations that are starting. And, um, within uh, the farmers or within the ministry board? No, within the farmers, no, the farmers. entirely from the farmers, yeah. No, so, um, yes, we should probably talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a few people working on that right now and you know just it's very early stages and gathering ideas and opinions and things but um, yeah hopefully that'll be sort of to disseminate information and um, represent raw milk producers and help them work with regulatory bodies um, because you know, there's also uh, raw milk is so niche that actually it's not something where the food standards agency or environmental health can advise there's a lot of inconsistency and approach yeah. in different parts of the country yeah. and things. And so hopefully a raw milk producers group could sort of help work with the regulators and educate the regulators and educate each other and so that's, that's the thing that I found so extraordinary too when I did my article, which actually was staggering the idea I was going to actually say it was so at the end. But the, the, the given that it is so, I mean it clearly is growing quite fast, but it is still quite a niche, it's basically a kind of a sort of a farmer's market product for, for most of us, I guess. Um, but the level of kind of um, sort of residual public paranoia about it, I found completely extraordinary. And that's what you were alluding to in the kind of comments underneath the article. So I spent a very pleasant day with Dave <laughs> discovered this extraordinary drink. And I do urge anybody who hasn't done so to go to a raw milk farm and actually see the, 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 I mean, because the, 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 the sort of hygiene standards and the procedures that you go through are, are really, really impressive. And if you've been to an ordinary dairy farm, you can you instantly see the difference. And I was completely reassured and completely, this is clearly a wonderful, wonderful thing for everybody. And all the, all the research there is about how, you know, how the health benefits are really proven. And you, you know, anybody who's got allergies or that kind of thing, raw milk is, 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 is you know, is, is medically proven to be. All that kind of stuff. And I was completely taken aback by the level of, uh, sort of hostility that there was simply to the idea of it. And it's clearly, there's some kind of sort of, I don't know whether it's perpetuated by who perpetuates it, or whatever, but in, in the kind of collective memory, there is a there is a kind of well, TB, there is a TB was unpasteurized was dairy stuff, deadly, killer, dangerous, and I was called irresponsible, evil, and child murderer, and everything for kind of can I, promoting. Can I just ask, were you aware of the age group of these people who were against it? No, no, not, no, not, not. So one of the big things in the beginning, like sort of years ago, spruce and that Okay. Yeah. TB touched so many families yeah. now, yeah. 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 around the world, it's gone the increase again. And therefore it is seen, therefore there has been unfortunately rather like a hypothesis, fat is bad, don't eat fat. Mm -hmm. If milk is given, it is, is 
associated with TB moved on in the region. It's been unfortunate in the sense that it's happened. What I'm not going to get involved with is the, is the data behind it. There's lots of data out there. The outbreaks of illnesses, contagions, often come from pasteurized genesis. Okay. Many more issues in America <coughs> with outbreaks around pasteurized cheese yeah. worked, or indeed, as was discussed. I'm not saying, I mean, you know, there is a, um, a responsibility. And at the end of the day, if it goes wrong, Dave is held to task. Charlie and the farm are held to task. Your milk that you buy that's pasteurized and moisturized is anonymous, apart from the retail of the dairy. So I think this is a, a, an, an important point to raise, is the personal engagement and the responsibility. But I think I'd like to come back to the crucial reason why we're here, which is on flavor. So uh, five, six years ago, when I ran the two um, in, in um, two separate years, the raw milk to tasting out of many, it was a close battle between two milks. And I'd like to hear this evening what we all felt about. And this isn't a competition. No winners or losers, because we're winners to have this amazing opportunity to taste these milks. So the last milk you had was Jersey, which had the highest fat content, it was very kindly uh, brought up from Modric in Dorset. So thank you very much for bringing that. So let's hear it for Jersey. Did you enjoy the Jersey? Yes. 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 Then before that, we had the Fen Farm, which was the Montbelliard Friesia. But that was a clean milk, yeah, yeah. clean, lighter in style, yeah. really green, yeah. uh, sweeter. And then prior to that we had the poor hatch milk, which is the Merzrite Bissel, um, which is the biodynamic from the community farm. Again, lots of that. Yeah. And then Herbalbrook, which is the first milk we tried, which is the, the beta carotene, so the yellowness of it. So again, lots of that. Yeah. Well, I'll reveal to you that um, uh, those two separate raw milk tutor tastings gave the same result in two years in a row. Which was that it was an absolute head-to-head -head between the Jersey and the Guernsey uh, because of the, the, the fat content was giving you the flavour. Yeah. There are nuances with, and there are nuances, I think, with, for instance, Merz Wright, this sort of model they are, and I encourage you to um, Go and find when you're traveling around the country to look up raw milk farmers and go and taste the different milks. It's important. Um, Tali uh, and Carla have brought literature. Um, I think we really owe the farmers. Uh, Dave and Rosie forgot. <coughs> Even now, I remind you. That's Dave and Rosie, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I encourage you to support and um, to read all about what they do in the publication that will be brought by. Tali by Gala and to look up on the Herbalbrook website, the Defend Farm website, the uh, Mockery website, and to just immerse yourself more in this unique flavour profile that we've had this evening from different books. So I'm a member of uh, the um, uh, community farm. You don't have to live nearby. It's inexpensive, it shows your support, and it regenerates community agriculture in the most profound way. I think we have a big round of applause for the yeah. and Also to our helpers, um, so that's Libby. Uh, and, and to Hattie for putting up with me, uh, going on at her to have a raw milk to take. <laughs> So now what we have is butter. Now, um, we have a, a fantastic cross-section of butter. Uh, they're all labelled, so uh, um, uh, we've been able to do that for you. I encourage you to eat it, first of all, on its own. Okay, rather just slap it on some uh, bread. Have it on its own and just get that sense of the butter and the, and the, and the essence of the cow in the butter through its cream. Um, and then we've also got some cream from both Herbalbrook and from Floor Hatch. So that's cream like you've never tasted before. That's like custard, exquisite. You've got half an hour there about. So, so, so please indulge. And before you go, um, I've got a, a, a giveaway bag for each of you. Um, 
um, absolutely shamelessly promoting health. Um, um, uh, so, but no, but it is there for you to enjoy because we've got lots of interesting new foods and our story is one that is all about encouraging appreciation for flavours um, and true nutrients. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you.